I've, I've been wanting to do this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome everyone and thanks very much for coming along to uh, this evening's lecture. It will be very, very interesting. Uh, your own will, uh, will prove that, no doubt at all. Uh, just a few little things first of all. Uh, could you uh, pay attention to the, uh, the notice of the fire escape notice and such like? And if anything does happen there, just follow that and leave in an orderly manner, please. Uh, secondly, switch all your telephones off. Um, because uh, there is a £20 fine for the first one. Uh, it will decrease for the second and third, but uh, the first one is a £20 fine. It's only been paid, well, it hasn't been paid, has it? <laughs> no, it, it was only incurred once by the past president, so, uh, and he didn't pay. So there we are. Um, yes, uh, the fire exits. Um, switch your phones off. Um, no photographs, please, in the building, and I'm sure Jerome would. Uh, quite happily give you a transcript or we have transcripts that will probably be on YouTube and such like so you won't miss anything. Um, right, um, well I'm sorry to delay you too much but we have a few little bits of procedural agenda that we go through first of all. Thank you very much Steve. The minutes of our last meeting for February uh, this lecture was given by Dr. Richard Curry of Sustained Steel on sustainable steel manufacture and uh, a possible future for steel in the Northeast. We had an excellent attendance, several excellent questions. Uh, the vote of thanks was given by Norman Jackson and closing remarks by the President. So if we can take that as an accurate record of the last meeting, Steve. Our next lecture is on the 21st of April. This is a joint lecture with the Institute of Civil Engineers on treating mine workings along the A1 redevelopment uh, just in Newcastle Bar, and this will be given by Sarah Coverdale. Moving on to our May lecture, uh, this is on the fascinating area of the terahertz region of electromagnetic radiation and seeing what new applications can be uh, discovered and utilised from this really interesting part of the spectrum. And that will be given by Professor Andrew Gallant from the University of Durham. Our June lecture, rounding off our 2021 to 22 lecture series, is given by Keith Hutchinson of the Safina Group. And this is on ship design for operational efficiency and sustainability. This is a joint lecture with the Royal Institution of Naval Architects, the Nautical Institute, and the Institute of Marine Engineering Science and Technology. Uh, together, they form the Northeast Coast Joint Branch, and we're delighted that this is going to be our first joint lecture with them, uh, the, hopefully the first of many. Don't forget, you can find out all about our events and activities by following us online along the usual social channels. We, and uh, in particular, we have a ever-increasing fantastic back catalogue of our lectures on our YouTube channel. If you want to find out more about what we do, well, currently you're at one of our excellent lecture events. Uh, we have a range of conferences that we put on each year. In the autumn, we have an annual dinner where men and women across the north of England come together to talk about fan, you know, fantastic developments in science and engineering, as well as have an excellent, uh, excellent night out. We also have bi-monthly socials and of course, our ever increasing range of field trips. Here we all are trying to find that millipede that was uh, discovered recently uh, up just near Howick. So don't forget there's plenty of benefits to becoming a member of the Institute from postnomials, invitations to our events uh, and a range of other opportunities to get involved. So do go ahead and visit mineinstitute.org.uk forward slash membership for more information. And with that I'll hand it back to Steve for what should be a really fascinating lecture about some very important engineering that's coming currently going on in our region. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, for the, uh, for the main feature of the evening, now we've got over all of that stuff, um, we are very fortunate tonight in having uh, Professor Jeroen van Doenen to uh, give us a talk on modeling mine water heat extraction. Um, that's uh, involving GEMS, that's the geothermal energy from mines and solar geothermal heat. And uh, he's going to tell us, can coal mines warm our homes once again? Uh, warm water is the, uh, in the, what, of the 23,000 disused flooded mines in the UK, uh, offer a huge low carbon geothermal energy source that could heat, cool and provide heat storage for a quarter of the homes in the UK and businesses. Uh, notably e economically disadvantaged regions such as former mining and urban communities. 
uh, to utilize and optimize this uh, enormous energy supply and storage opportunity. I hope I'm not taking too much away from your talk. <laughs> uh, research is required in a number of aspects, uh, including optimized abstraction strategies of the heat sources, introduction of innovative heat storage solutions to level our diurnal and seasonal energy demand fluctuations, mapping the financial landscape for mine geothermal energy and integration of the technical aspects with governance frameworks. Um, just an introduction to your own. He's uh, a professor in computational geoscience at the University of Durham. He has 25 years of research experience in uh, modeling Earth systems and dynamics and uh, leads a geodynamic research group. His research involves numerical fluid flow modeling on a range of scales from uh, Earth's mantle's convection and plate tectonics down to water flow through abandoned mines. Uh, he recently obtained a £1.6 million pound funding from the UKRI for the uh, interdisciplinary research project, which is GEMS, as I have said, uh, that will explore the various challenges involved in using water from flooded and abandoned mines. Uh, just to, again as a little uh, brief uh, introduction, um, I can tell you that, uh, uh, that uh, Jerome um, started off uh, in the Netherlands um, at Utrecht University, uh, did a postdoctoral research in uh, Colorado, University of Colorado, moved to the second best university in, uh, in, the, in Europe, uh, that's the ETH in Zurich, and now uh, started in 2006, uh, right out to the present, um, moving up from lecturer to professor in the Department of Earth Sciences. So I'm sure you're tired of hearing my voice now, so I'm going to have the pleasure of handing you over to Jerome uh, to give you the talk on the mine water heat extraction. Thank you, Jerome. Well, thank you very much for this kind of introduction. I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to be able to talk about my research on uh, mine water heating in front of an audience from the Mining Institute. This is uh, brilliant. Can you all hear me? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, particularly, actually, it's also nice to be able to give a talk in front of a live audience in a, in a really nice uh, lecture hall as well. So, um, so the, the talk will be about uh, can coal mines uh, warm our homes again? And uh, what I plan to talk about today is, uh, is first of all, um, an introduction to mine water heating, assuming that not everybody is familiar with the topic. Then I'll talk about the GEMS project that was already introduced uh, briefly. Um, the reason for talking about this project, uh, which actually only just started, is because it, it, uh, it uh, lays out the, the typical challenges that we face with uh, uh, mine water heating, rolling out mine water heating. Uh, then I'll go on to talking about numerical modeling of mine water heating and how we might be able to use that to, to understand uh, heat extraction better. Uh, and I'll end up with, uh, with an application uh, by looking at the feasibility study to see if uh, mine water heating could be applied at Durham University. Okay, so um, my background is, uh, is not really in mine water heating. I only started looking into mine water heating and doing research on it several years back. Before that, I, I looked at uh, uh, larger scale systems, fluid dynamical systems of the earth. And in particular, looking at things like uh, mental convection and plate tectonics. So I thought to, to kind of start with a slide that kind of uh, shows uh, why mines are warm from a, from a large scale perspective. So when the Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago, it was really hot. Everything was completely molten. Obviously, the Earth has cooled down quite a bit, but it's still very hot interiorly. It's like six and a half, seven thousand degrees in the center. And it constantly releases heat to the, to the surface. Um, 44 terawatts, so that's 44 and then 12 zeros watts. It's a lot of heat coming out of the earth. Um, uh, and uh, to put, what, well, kind of a number that might mean a little bit more, 60 uh, milliwatts for every square meter of the earth. And to just put that into perspective, uh, if you add up all the energy that all human beings on earth are consuming, that's less than half of that. So in other words, if we would be able to utilize the heat that comes out of the earth, uh, somehow, uh, we wouldn't have to worry at all about energy. It would provide us all the energy we need almost forever. 
So the, the, the bottom line here is that we have a huge energy source available to us if we, can, if we are able to use it. Now, some parts of the world have more energy coming out, more, more heat coming out than others, uh, particularly at the edges of plates, such as, such as Iceland. But even in the UK, we have a decent amount of heat coming through, uh, uh, through the, the, the surface, uh, about 60, it's, it's just under 60 uh, milliwatts per square meter. It actually leads to a thermal gradient, so the temperature gradient from a cold surface to a hot interior, of about 30 degrees per kilometer. Uh, and that can be verified by, oh, I knew I was going to do this. Um, that um, can be verified by, by just looking at um, this, this plot here on, on the right, which shows uh, the typical temperatures that are observed in mines at different depths. And you can actually see that gradient of roughly 30 degrees per kilometer. Okay, so a few more numbers, um, just to, to set the scene for mine water heating. We have about 23,000 uh, mines in the UK, um, and, and almost all of them are not used anymore today, and almost all of them are actually flooded with, with water at the moment. Um, most of these mines are located in, uh, well, around here. There's, there's, there's quite a large proportion of mines here. We're also in southern uh, Scotland, the Midlands, and, and South Wales. It's estimated that r roughly one in four homes are built right on top of a mine. So that's, that's quite significant. Um, and um, the, the, the mine water temperature varies between 12 and 25 degrees. 12 for the shallower mines, 25 for, for the deeper mines. And um, that's obviously not enough to warm our homes with. But what we can do is to use uh, heat pump technologies to, to raise the temperature to a much more comfortable 40 to 50 degrees. Um, finally, it's been estimated that if you would take all the water out of all the mines in the UK uh, and use the heat out of it, that would be sufficient to warm all the homes on top of it for at least 100 years. So again, we've got a really significant uh, heat source. So how does this then work? Well, it's, it's essentially uh, what is referred to as an open loop system. So we would extract heat from the mines. The mine, we, we, we extract the mine water from the mines. It goes to a, a heat pump. The heat pump takes the heat out um, and then uh, returns the, the cold water back into the mines, which somehow then floats back to the abstraction point um, and the circle uh, the, 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 the can start all over again. Uh, the heat that's taken out is then transferred into uh, a closed loop system that is then uh, warming water up uh, and uh, hopefully can we use that to warm our homes. So the magic seems to be happening in this heat pump. So how does a heat pump actually work? Well, the short answer is your fridge at home is a heat pump. But maybe a, a slightly more useful answer is to explain this diagram. So uh, you, the, the core of a heat pump is essentially a closed loop system that's filled with a refrigerant, a, a, a fluid with a cer certain, certain properties. And uh, there is a, a pump here that constantly pumps fluid out of this left reservoir into the right reservoir. And there's a, there's a valve at the bottom that kind of uh, prevents it from quickly flowing back. Now, that pump here leads to, uh, uh, that, uh, leads to conditions that the left reservoir is always having a very low pressure and the right reservoir having a high pressure because the fluid is constantly pumped from this reservoir into the other one. The low pressures here lead to evaporation of that refrigerant. So it goes from a liquid to a gas. And in order to, to go from a liquid to a gas, you need to absorb latent heat. And that latent heat has been is, is, uh, extracted from the surrounding. And in this case, the surrounding is a pipe that's wrapped around uh, the cylinder that's filled with this mine water. So it's extracted from the mine water. On the other side, the opposite is happening. The high pressure leads to condensation of that gas back to a fluid. Uh, and the condensation would release latent heat and that heat is then being uh, absorbed by the closed loop network that goes to our home. So that's essentially how this works. And the fridge, to, to go back to the comparison with the fridge, the inside of the fridge is the left, si left side of this diagram, uh, and the, the right side of this diagram is essentially the back of the fridge where you've got this radiator. Now, why is this such a useful tool, and why can we use this in the future? Well, in order to run the system, we, for every kilowatt that we put into a heat pump to, to run that pump, we get about 3.9 kilowatts of heat out of the system. So that's a good deal. Um, 
and, and that's why we would like to use it. Now, this number 3.9 is not fixed. It depends on the situation. If the mine water is really cold, or if you want to warm up this water on the other hand to really high temperatures, that, that performance goes down to lower numbers. Um, therefore, the, the typical water temperature coming out on the other end is typically between 40 and 50 degrees, because that's optimal. That's, that's a good, that's high enough temperature to warm your home with, but it's not so high that the coefficient of performance goes down. Okay, um, so mine water heating is actually uh, a fairly new technique, certainly in the UK, but uh, even around the world, it's not really used on a large scale at all. But it's not a new technique, really, in the sense that uh, already back in the 1980s, uh, it was used in a, in a town called Spring Hill uh, in Nova Scotia in Canada, where they took the water out of the mines and, and warmed several of the premises in the town. Uh, and they've been doing this ever since the 1980s, so it's not really new. In Europe, there's also a number of examples where, where it's been successfully applied, including northern Spain and in Poland and in Germany. Perhaps the, the best known example is Heerlen in the Netherlands. At least in the community, everybody always talks about Heerlen in the Netherlands. Um, they, they started the system in the, in the early 2000s, and by 2008, they had a... a that they upgraded it to what they called Mine Water 2.0 to give it a fancy name. Uh, and essentially what they're doing is they're having two reservoirs. Two, they use two seams of the mines. One deep one at 700 meters and a shallower one at 250 meters. And in the winter, they pump up the water from the deep, the deep uh, uh, seam, the deep uh, mine workings, use the heat and, uh, and the, the, the rest water, the cold mine water, is put back in the shallower uh, seam. Um, in the summer, they do the reverse. They take the, the cold water out of the shallower sea, use it for air conditioning, and put the, the warmed water back into the deeper sea. And in that way, they can maintain the system for, for well, hopefully, indefinitely. Um, closer to home, uh, we also have several successful examples. I, I don't have time to go into a lot of them, but just want to mention one, which is Lanchester Wines, um, which is actually not in Lanchester, but the warehouses are based in Gateshead. Uh, it's, it's a company, as the name suggests, uh, dealing with wines. They have to keep those wines at a constant temperature, and they warm uh, the warehouse, the warehouses, I must say. It's two separate warehouses. They warm them using mine water heating. They started this several years ago, had some teething problems to start with, but it's, but it's up and running, and it's working nicely now. Um, there's also a number of projects uh, upcoming. So projects that aren't really ready to go, but, but some of them are getting pretty close. And, and Gateshead is probably in the, one of the most advanced stages. So this is the, the town center of Gateshead, where they, they hope to warm 1,250 private homes. They already drilled the boreholes. Uh, they've done some testing. I think they're more or less ready to, to, to give it a go. Uh, another project that's upcoming, uh, uh, probably in a few years' time, is referred to as the Seam Garden Village. This is an entire village that doesn't exist yet, but it's going to be built. And that entire village is planned to be warmed using mine water. Now, this is a slightly different situation in the sense that it's close to the, the, the village of, the, the existing village of Seam, uh, town of Seam, uh, where they have the Dorden uh, mine water treatment plant. This is actually related to the Dorden Colliery that used to be there a long time ago. And this is one of the places where they didn't switch off the, the water pumps and they're still pumping water out of the system. They, they, they don't uh, do that because they, they keep on using the mines, but they do this because otherwise the mine water would flow into a, an overlying aquifer that we use for our drinking water. And it might pollute the drinking water. So that's why uh, they, keep, they, they take the water out. They don't put the water back in. They only take it out and they release it to the surface water. Uh, that's uh, Seam Garden Village is going to be something on the order of 1,500 homes plus uh, support buildings like shops and so on and schools. So significant size. Um, so uh, mine water heating is, is becoming more and more popular and, and we're looking more and more into the, into the possibilities. But it also becomes clear that there's quite a number of challenges associated with it. It's, it's, it's definitely more complex than for example, wind turbines or, 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 or something like that. So uh, there's, therefore, there's also been quite a bit of funding 
uh, made available for people to do research on it. And a few years ago, in 20, back in 2020, roughly when, when, when lockdown started, uh, a, a number of us from Durham University started to um, put a proposal together to look at this. And um, these were myself from Earth Sciences, but also a, a, a few of my colleagues, people from engineering, from anthropology, from the business school. We wanted to look at the various different aspects that are associated with my mortality. Um, and luckily for us, we were successful. Uh, that's the GEMS project that was mentioned uh, uh, before already uh, during the introduction. Uh, so it's a project between Durham University and the British Geological Survey. Uh, and we have a number of project partners which, who, with whom we, we hope to work with to get data and knowledge uh, uh, to, to, to get up and running as quickly as possible. So that project only recently started and uh, will go on for the next uh, three years, hopefully. Um, in a nutshell, what this, what this project, what we hope to do with this project is to look at basically four different challenges. One of them is associated with extracting the heat from the ground. How do we do this most efficiently? How can we make sure uh, it's not depleting the ground and we end up with cold water? Then we're going to look into uh, heat storage, and I'll explain that in a minute. We need to look at uh, regulations and policies, uh, uh, see if, they, if, they're, if they're suitable for mine water heating. And finally, we also want to make sure that whatever scheme uh, we all come up with to do with mine water heating, that it's suitable for the end user, the person who's actually going to use it in their homes. So just to elaborate a little bit more on all four of those points, um, okay, all four of those points, is, um, okay, so the, the first one, how do we make sure that the heat is extracted efficiently? Um, well, first of all, I, I already explained that we, this is an open loop system. So in other words, we don't only take the water out, we also put it back in. The reason for doing this is otherwise we end up with situations like this, where the water uh, might get funny colors because we, we dump uh, polluting water to, uh, to, to a surface water in the rivers and the seas. And obviously, for environmental reasons, that's not a good idea. So we want to put this back into the mines, but we have to be, make sure that we understand what we're doing. If we put the cold water back in, uh, how can we then make sure that if we keep on doing this year after year, that the whole system doesn't cool down, and in the end we end up uh, pumping cold water up instead of hot water, and then the whole thing is broken. So that's something we want to, want to make sure before we start doing expensive drilling. Um, this is, so, uh, so one of the aims in, in, in the GEMS project is to look at this using numerical modeling, modeling tools. Uh, so... Um, we developed a, a numerical modeling tool, and I'll talk a little bit, well, I'll talk quite a lot about it later on. So I'm not going to go into too much detail right now, but just to mention that uh, those numerical models are only as good as the uh, information you put into those systems. That's probably true for every numerical model. You need to put the right, the, the, the right information in. In this case, the right information involves uh, 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 mine plans. We need accurate information about the configuration of the mines on the ground to, to, to run those models. What we also need is accurate information uh, in terms of physical parameters, uh, rock properties, uh, fluid properties, those kind of things. Uh, and we want to somehow test whatever numerical model we build. Is it actually working? Can we test it against a real example? Well, luckily for us, um, the, there is a, um, um, sorry, luckily for us, there is a um, uh, laboratory being set up and it's almost ready to go uh, in uh, Glasgow. It's called the Glasgow Geo Observatory, Geo Energy Observatory. And essentially it's just an old mine system where they drill boreholes into it, put lots of monitoring equipment in it, and it's being made available for research. So we can do experiments there test all kind of things, and then compare that to our numerical model. So that's one of the things we hope to do. Um, in terms of the mine plans, uh, these will come from the core authority because they actually own all the mine plans. Uh, so we get the, the mine plans from the core authority. Um, the problem with those mine plans is that um, some of them are really old, especially, actually, some of the mines are really old uh, here in, in uh, what well, the Gateshead mines, for example, are more than 150 years old. And so are the mine plans, uh, which are hand-drawn mine plans. They're not actually that accurate. 
Um, the other thing is that when they closed the mines, we, we're not really sure how they were left behind. Did they backfill the mines with rubble when they closed it down or, or have parts of it collapsed by now? And therefore we need not just the plans, we need information about those mines. And actually, we, we, we got a lot of this information from, from talking to, uh, to mining engineers, for example. They, they provided us with lots of information about what, what, how to interpret those, those plans and, and what to expect. Well, how, how, how do the mines look like right now? Um, okay. Um, and finally, we hope to get some data from the project partners that already have some schemes up and running, like, like Lanchester Wines or, or, the, or the company in, in Heerlen. Right, I'll come back to uh, modeling later on. I'm going to go and talk a little bit about the other challenges. One of them is um, fluctuating heat demand. So we obviously need heat mostly in the winter and not in the summer. And even during the winter, we mostly need it during the day. So um, now for conventional heating systems, that's easy. You just switch on and off your gas boiler and that's it. That, that will deal with it. But for uh, mine water heating and probably any other type of heating that uses some kind of heat network, it's going to be much more complicated. And therefore, a better solution is probably to, to make sure you store the heat so you can actually tap into it when you need it. That's kind of a better way of doing this. So um, what uh, we plan to do is uh, to look at two types of, of heat storage. One is uh, the seasonal, long-term storage. Where can we store heat? Uh, how can we make sure that the heat is available when we take it out of the ground? Well, the idea is that maybe in the summer we can, we can store, we take the heat out of solar panels or, or other ways, put it into the ground, um, and then in the winter we, we take it back. So we, we're looking into this, again, with some modeling and using that uh, Glasgow uh, Geo Observatory, Geo Energy Observatory, um, that hopefully... Uh, will be able to, to, to tell us whether this is feasible or not. If we put the heat down there in the summer, is it still there in the winter or not? These, these are the kind of questions we need to find an answer to. The other thing we're looking into is more short-term heat storage and uh, looking, looking at clever engineering techniques, for example, sorption techniques. Uh, this is what my colleagues in engineering are working on, and, and they're, they're, divide, they're, they're building devices that we can actually maybe even put in our homes, to, which are able to store heat in a very compact way that we can extract it when, when it's needed. Um, right, uh, the end user. This is important. Um, so whatever we're going to do, if we're going to, sooner or later, we're not going to be allowed to use gas boilers anymore. They're going to, they're going to be phased out. I think in, in, uh, already in 2025, it's not allowed to, to, to build a new home with a gas boiler in it. So, and, and, and even the older homes at, so, at some point won't be able to use gas boilers anymore. So that's going to lead to some disruption in all of our homes because probably almost all of us are still using gas boilers. Um, the other problem is, as I, I mentioned, that uh, heat pump systems, any heat pump systems, are also ground source or air source heat pumps, they, they provide temperatures of 40 to 50 degrees, which actually is quite a bit lower than the temperature in your radiator today, which is more on the order of 70 or 80 degrees. So actually, 40 or 50 degrees is not going to really warm our homes with the conventional radiators, and perhaps we need to put in systems like underfloor heating. Again, more disruption. So we need to, we need to think about how to, how to actually break the news to the end user that we have to maybe do these kind of things. But perhaps the more important one is the cost. Is this going to be uh, more expensive or not? And there's probably two types of costs we can, in, 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 we can divide this into. There's capital upfront costs, and then there is the running cost. Well, capital cost, that's, that's, uh, that's a problem. It's expensive. Uh, just uh, uh, the little, a little summary here in this, uh, in this table here shows you that we need two boreholes. We need a, a water pump to get the mine water up. We need that heat pump plus uh, a lot of paperwork that quickly adds up to something like £400,000 for one system. So if, yeah. even if you divide it over uh, a small neighborhood, that's still a lot of money. It might be all right, though, if we know that the running costs are going to be low, okay? because then it will pay itself back over time. So uh, is that the case? Well, um, uh, I mentioned this coefficient of performance, which is good news. So we only put one kilo 
kilowatts of heat into, uh, or energy into it and get 3.9 out of it. So you'd think that's cheaper than using the conventional way. But there is one problem, is that that heat pump uses electricity and gas boilers obviously use gas. And gas is a lot cheaper than electricity. In fact, uh, over 2021, it was about four and a half times more expensive. So that kind of cancels out our advantage of, of, of using a heat pump. So at the moment, my water heating is slightly more expensive than you keep on using your gas boiler, which is not something that we want to advertise, obviously. However, this is likely to going, going to change. I mean, it's all in the news. Gas prices are, are shooting up. Uh, so this ratio, as a consequence, is rapidly dropping. So very soon, uh, electricity prices uh, will be uh, low enough so that it becomes uh, economically viable. And that is, of course, without taking into account the environmental costs, which obviously are a lot lower for mine water heating uh, compared to fossil fuels. Uh, whatever we're going to uh, come up with, whatever scheme we're going to come up with, we want to make sure that this is not going to be imposed on the end user. We want to make sure that this is something uh, that we, we need to talk with the end users. What is the best way to introduce this? So we want, we would, what we hope to do is to kind of work with the end users coming up with a solution. Um, okay, finally, something that is a little bit related is, um, it relates to governance. Uh, things like regulations and policies and finance schemes. A, a lot of these things are not really suitable for mine water heating, simply for the simple fact that, that, that it's a new system. And the old rules uh, might not be that suitable anymore. Just to give you one example um, uh, about regulations, apparently there is no regulation that describes who owns heat below 300 meters depth. Uh, so in other words, uh, any heat below 300 meters, anyone can use it. We don't have to, it, it's, it's not owned by anyone. Um, clearly, if we want to use heat for commercial purposes, that's something we need to look into then, uh, because that, that's not suitable. Um, Financing is another uh, issue. Uh, I already mentioned the upfront cost, the, the capital cost. Uh, it's not only uh, uh, expensive to start a system, it's also actually very risky. Uh, because risky in, in, uh, from an operational point of view, I mean. Uh, because uh, we need to drill boreholes into the mine systems. Now, um, drilling boreholes into the mine systems is, is complicated. We need to go very deep and we need to make sure that we end up in one of those mine workings. But quite often those, those, those boreholes are drilled and they miss the mine, uh, uh, the, the mine workings. And then basically that, that borehole becomes useless. Um, so you need to drill another one. Um, oh, am I pressing the button? Okay. Um, so... Um, well, the combination of high risk and high capital costs is not going to attract a lot of investors. That's a problem. So if we want to make this work, we need to somehow come up with a scheme that, that, that uh, uh, maybe, maybe a government scheme that, that allows investors to, to invest in it without taking the risk, something like this. Finally, we might actually have an opportunity here to, um, to look into leveling up. Uh, it's the, it's the mining community that, that over generations build all those mines. Maybe it could be those mining communities as well that benefit from the heat coming out of it or maybe the job opportunities that this is going to give us. So this is something that we probably want to think about and look into. Um, right, that's in a nutshell the challenges that we face with, with uh, mine water heating. What I would like to do for the remaining part of the talk is to talk a little bit more about the, the numerical modeling because that's actually where, where my own expertise come in and that's uh, uh, what I've been working on myself. So we set up this numerical modeling tool. Uh, so let me briefly explain how this works. So here uh, at the top right, we've got a typical uh, mine plan. It's, it's actually from somewhere underneath Durham. Um, the, the, the system that was used to, to mine this particular seam is the, the pillar install method. So uh, essentially you, you, you dig roadways into the coal, that's how the coal is extracted, but pillars are left behind, otherwise the whole coal seam would collapse. Um, so what we thought of doing is to mimic this, this set of roadways as a, as a series of, of tunnels or, or pipes. So we, we, we modeled this, well, 
we model this with uh, a number of, of, of pipes and then create a pipe network. So simplistically shown here at the bottom right, this is a very simple example. And once we've got a pipe network set up, uh, what we can do, do is to then decide we inject the water at one point and we abstract the water at another point. We can then calculate how the water would flow through the pipe system. And once we know how it flows through it, we can also calculate how the water would warm up as it flows through the, the pipe system. So that's in a nutshell how this, how this modeling works. So in a little bit more detail, how do we calculate the flow field? This becomes a little bit technical. but uh, So basically, we treat each pipe segment separately. So if you know the, the water pressure at one end of a pipe segment, and you know the water pressure at the other end, and you also know a few properties of the pipe segment itself, like, like the, the size, the diameter, and maybe the roughness of the walls, and maybe the, the, the viscosity of the fluid that goes through it, then you can calculate how fast the fluid will go through that one pipe segment. And then what we can do is to link all the pipe segments together, make a first estimate of all those water pressures at either end of the pipes, calculate how the water is going to flow through all of the pipes, find out that that's probably not the right solution because some, some parts, some nodes, will actually have accumulating water from all sides because the water pressure was so low there. Uh, what we then do is to adjust the water pressure and try again. So it's an iterative method and we keep on doing this until the solution doesn't change anymore and then we've got a, a solution for the water flow. That's in a nutshell how this works. This is mathematically done by solving a matrix vector system. But, um, then the next step is, um, is uh, uh, can we calculate the, the, the heat exchange between the water and uh, the rock? Uh, so the water flows through the pipe segment and we know how much heat is going to be taken out of the rock into the water so we can then calculate how much the water will warm up through this one pipe segment and at the same time we can calculate how much the, the rock as a consequence is going to cool, cool down. Um, so it's essentially a simple heat balance that we can do almost analytically um, and then we can do this for all pipe segments together by starting at the the, the upstream one, we calculate how much the water is warming up from here to here, then do the next pipe and the next pipe and so on, until you reach the very last pipe segment, which is probably the point where you abstract the water, and then you know uh, the temperature field through the entire system. So that's in a nutshell how this, these calculations work. So how does that work in, in general? Just to give you a very, very simple example. Um, suppose we've got a very schematic, simple mine system with just two roadways, and we're injecting water on the left, we're abstracting water on the right. And it has two paths to go, the top and the bottom path. But there's a slight difference between the two that this one pipe segment here is made slightly thinner than all the others. Therefore, the water can't really flow as fast through the, the bottom uh, uh, roadway and it will only flow through the top roadway. And you can actually see that in the solution, this is the flow field where red is fast, blue is slow. The temperature field, uh, as a consequence, is also different because this fast-flowing water through the top uh, roadway doesn't have a lot of time to warm up. So it ends up relatively cold, but quite a lot of water ends up here. The bottom roadway has more time to warm up, so the water is going to be warmer. Uh, and what you're abstracting here is some kind of weighted average of the two pipes flowing in. So that's, in a nutshell, how this works. But obviously, this is not looking at all like a real mine. So now we have to do the next step, and that is to uh, kind of get real mine plans in, 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 in the whole problem. So this is an example of one of those, well, the typical mine plan. This is probably how, how it might look like. What we do is to digitize this mine plan. So we basically, we, we use ArcGIS, a piece of software, to, to kind of digitize all of these uh, little roadways, um, which actually can be quite time consuming, but we set up a, 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 a mechanism to do this relatively quickly. <clears throat> and um, then we might up, end up with a digitized version of the mine. So if this is the same mine plan I showed you before, then this could be a digitized version of that mine plan. So what can we do with, with these kind of things? So let me show you a few simple examples of how this code could be used. If we take this, this same example that I, I showed you before and we decide to inject the water here and abstract it uh, uh, somewhere else, an arbitrary point, then the, the water is going to flow from here to here through the mine system. Uh, and the warmer colors means it flows faster. So you can see at the edges, it's not flowing at all. The plot on the, on the right shows the corresponding temperature field. So as the water flows through the system, it's slowly warming up 
all the way to the end point. And in this particular example, it warmed up to a temperature that's almost the maximum temperature, the rock temperature. Um, okay, so is this, is this useful? Well, we probably want to compare this with other scenarios. So if this was a scenario where we injected the water with 50 cubic meters per hour. So, uh, or that's, that I think that's equivalent to something like 17 liters per second. Um, so, uh, which might be suitable for, um, I don't know, warming up a, a small building. Uh, what if we increase this to 200 uh, cubic meters per second? So four times as large, so we can actually warm four times as many homes with it. Does that work? Well, no, not really, because the temperature of the water, the water flows through the system now so fast that it doesn't really warm up enough. Okay, so this is one of the things you can, you can investigate with this. Another thing you can look at is what are the optimal locations to inject and abstract the water. Is the previous one was better than this one because the outflow temperature is, is lower in this one. And that's because these two points are so close together, the water doesn't have time to warm up. And most of the, most of the heat of the mine is untapped. It just stays in there. So this is obviously not the right location. Uh, or you can look at multiple users. So in this case, we put two injection points and two abstraction points uh, having two users using the same mine system uh, because that might be what we want to use in the future uh, again uh, you have to be careful with this because they might be stealing each other's heat so to speak um, right so that's how the, the modeling works now what I would like to show you is a, 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 like a, an, a real application of this code so how can we really use this um, I have to say uh, uh, thanks to the person who actually did this work, which is uh, Michael McKenzie. He is a master student who started almost a year ago. He's almost finished uh, uh, writing his thesis. So it was perfect timing. So I can put it in this talk and, and show you his results because it's interesting. So what he, the, the purpose of, of, of his uh, master's thesis was to look at uh, whether some of the buildings at Durham University would be suitable uh, for mine water heating because right underneath the Durham University there is actually quite a lot of uh, mining activity as well. Um, okay, so just a map, Durham, Durham City. The university is actually located just to the south of it. So this is the, this is the, the, the science side, the campus of the university. And um, uh, if I zoom in on that area, that, that's this map, so you can here see it's still the the, the southern part of the peninsula of, of Durham. Um, what you see here, the colors overlaying the map are the digitized version of two mine, uh, two uh, uh, mined coal seams, the Hutton seam uh, and the Busty seam in this particular case. The, the, the Hutton seam is a little bit older, has been mined um, uh, uh, a bit earlier, uh, is also shallower. The Busty seam sits deeper and was mined a bit later. The Basti seam actually is a lot larger than what I show here, but, um, but uh, this is the interesting bit. So now what, what we wanted to investigate is how uh, mine, work, mine heating might be applied here. And uh, the idea was to look at specific buildings. In fact, the, the, the target to start with was uh, this star here, which is one college, which is uh, the Van Mildred College is one of the colleges of the university and they were interested in, in this scheme so, so Michael investigated this uh, so the idea is to inject cold water or yeah, cooled water into the Hutton seam then let it flow through the Hutton seam somehow seep into the lower seam the busty seam where it then flows back to Van Mildred and you use another borehole to extract it again so it would be the pathway through two seams and that is typical that's how uh, most of these mine, working, mine water heating schemes would work. So you inject it in one seam and then let it flow somewhere out and then down into another seam and then let it come back. Um, the, the triangle here shows one possible location where the two seams are connected. Uh, and this is um, because on the, on the mine plants there is actually an old shaft. There. So we, we assume that that old shaft might be a connecting point between the two the two seams. This is one of the uncertainties we have to deal with with the mine plants. We don't really know where the shafts are, whether they're still open. And these are the kind of uncertainties we, 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 we're dealing with. Okay, so this is, um, this is then one of the results. The colors aren't great, but uh, hopefully you can still see there's a bit of yellow everywhere. Yellow is the hottest temperatures in this case. 
Now, hottest temperatures is not really hot in this case. It's only 13 and a half degrees because that's the rock temperature of the mine system underneath Durham University. Um, but we decided to hypothetically inject the water at only 10 degrees. And, that, and then the, the aim was to see if you inject it at 10 degrees, let it flow around, are we able to extract it with 13 and a half degrees again? Because then it means that, that, then that, means that the system is actually working. So in this case, the water flows in all directions, cold water, so low temperatures, darker colors. It warms up um, slowly, very slowly, gets to this shaft, up from the upper seam into the lower seam, so these two are kind of connected, and then it flows back through the lower seam back to the Mildred where we extract the water again. The water temperature in this case is only 12 degrees, and the reason why this is so is probably what you can already see here. The distance from here to here is only a few hundred meters. That's actually not enough to warm the water up. Uh, it's, the pathway is just too short, unless you, unless you inject only a very small amount of water and let it flow really slowly, then it might warm up, but, if you, but, but then you don't have some, enough water to warm a whole building with, so it doesn't really work out. So on top of that, Van Mildred is a 1960s set of buildings. It's actually eight buildings. Um, and uh, a lot of retrofitting is probably needed to make it, to, to, make it, to insulate it better. To, so altogether, it's probably Van Mildred is not a good idea. So that was one of the conclusions, maybe, maybe not Van Mildred. But then um, Michael also looked into another scenario, which is the teaching and learning center. For those of you who know Durham University, this is a relatively new building, um, obviously used for teaching and learning. Um, it's a bit further north, and uh, we did exactly the same exercise. Inject the water with 10 degrees, hopefully it will warm up to 13 and a half degrees. And in this case, it did. The reason why is because the, the water had to actually take a quite a long path particularly through the Hutton seam to get here, then going to the other seam and then flowing quite a long distance back as well. So, so the pathway is longer and therefore this, for this building it's more suitable. On top of it, because it's a new building, it's very well insulated, so it doesn't need as much heat. It doesn't need as much water flowing through the system to, to provide the heating that we need. So this is just a, an example of how we can investigate which buildings are suitable, which sites would be suitable for, for mine water heating before we start to do expensive drilling. Now, that's almost the end of my talk. Uh, I would like to, just one final slide, and this is kind of future things that we would like to, to, to improve, because this modeling tool is not, is not finished yet. There's a lot of things we can improve with. First of all, we want to test it better, get calibrated against real data, because we haven't really had a, a an opportunity to do this for a real mine system, only, only simple testing. Um, then the other thing uh, that um, we haven't done really is to deal with local groundwater flow. I mean, we, we assume that this is all a closed loop system and, and there is no leaking into groundwater or groundwater leaking into the mines. Is this realistic? Maybe not in some cases. And therefore, we, we want to look into this as well by, by linking this system to, to local groundwater flow. Also, uh, I mentioned this pillar and stall method. That's what, we, that's what we aimed for. But there's actually other types of, of uh, coal extraction methods, like long wall mining, which would look quite different. So we need to, we need to um, accommodate that as well in the model somehow, or, or, or deal with partly collapsed or partly backfilled parts of the mine system somehow. And finally, um, we want to look more into the seasonal heat storage. So can we actually inject hot water in the summer and then extract cold water in the winter? These are the kind of experiments we would like to do, but we haven't done that yet. Um, and that's really it. So to conclude, hopefully I've convinced you that we have an enormous heat source underneath our feet uh, that we could make use of. Uh, I talked a little bit about the GEMS project, uh, particularly illustrating all the challenges that we have to deal with somehow. Um, uh, well, that it be might become economically viable to, do, to, to use mine water heating, particularly with the rising gas prices. Uh, I, I spoke about the modeling tool that we developed, and we applied this to uh, some of the premises on Durham University to illustrate how this tool can be used. And with that, I uh, thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much.
much for uh, asking me wonderful. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a few questions around. Um, could I ask anyone who wishes to ask a question to uh, wait until the microphone comes to them? And uh, then it would be okay on the rest of the systems that we're operating. So go ahead. Could you give your name and... Uh, yes. Uh, John Walker, uh, retired uh, member of the civil union. Um, I'm interested in what problems you might have uh, expected or encountered in the actual extraction water with the start of contamination from the mine working. Um, yeah, so, so the... the it, I, I have to admit I'm not really an expert on this, but, but listening to others who, who do know a lot more about this, there, is, there are some issues with the existing, uh, net, the, the existing pipe network that's set up to, to extract the heat. One of the problems is that if you extract the mine water, which is full of iron, um, then uh, if that comes into contact with, with, with air, it's going to react, and you got you get things like like ochre formed, and that, that kind of forms scaling on the on, on all the on all the things. So if if, if not careful, uh, that might actually ruin the, the system, or you have to clean it. Or so probably a good solution there is to make sure that it doesn't come into contact with air, which is probably doable when you keep on pumping pumping it around. But as soon as you stop it, probably the water just seeps back into the mine system, and you end up with with air in the pipes. So this is one of the problems. Uh, that, that I know that people are facing when it comes to with, so environmental. It's not really environmental in the sense that uh, you, you, it, it, it stays contained within the pipe system, but still, it's, it's, a, it's a chemical problem that needs to be dealt with. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. Port Oast, um, Sunderland. Um, putting boreholes down in the closed mines is a very difficult um, job to do, actually boring down into the areas that you want to. So the capital cost of actually um, committing to this, uh, you could be drilling actually two or three boreholes down just to get one. Yeah. It really puts the price or the, or the cost, the capital cost of the system quite high. So... Um, is that something that you've actually taken on board? Um, and I, I know I've, I've spent many hours in water up to my knees, my chest, and, and sometimes over my head down the pit, and I've never come across any warm water down there. It's always been wet and it's always been very cold. Um, <laughs> and it's just to me that when you put that one up of the, the coal seams at Durham, where you've got, yeah, I think I calculated 84 metres between the two seams, how are you going to get the water from one seam to another? I mean, there's no direct link, you know, and it's, it's a very difficult thing to do that. But yeah. really look forward to that uh, and hope you are successful when you, when you actually do achieve it. So, so I know that some of, some, some of the schemes where they drill boreholes, they actually encountered exactly what you said. They drilled a borehole, drilled into one of the pillars uh, and not in the mine workings, and they had to drill another one and another one. Uh, so that adds to the cost, and, that, and that's where the, where the risks come in, because the 400,000 is when everything goes well. If, if it doesn't go well, it might be five, 600,000 before, before you get something up and running. So that is a problem. On the other end, there are other places where it was more successful. I know, for example, in, in Bochum, in Germany, they set up a system and they drilled three boreholes and all three were successful. So um, it, it, uh, and it depends on, for example, the accuracy of the mine plans. Uh, if they're very accurate, then yes, uh, then, then, then probably, and, and having the right techniques of drilling, making sure that it doesn't drill under an angle, but really vertically down and so on, then it can be successful, but there is always a risk involved, so I, I agree with this. Um, I also heard of, um, I think this, this was the Gator system, where, where basically the bottom seam, where they drilled into it, it's not really connected to, to the upper seam. Um, so um, that means whatever shaft there was between one and the other, it's not connecting anymore. Maybe it's filled up, or maybe there were two separate shafts and so on. So uh, there what they did is actually they drilled a third borehole through both, uh, um, both workings. So you basically create a connection. And finally, you're right, the water probably would feel cold because, I don't know, 12 degrees Celsius is... Is not, it doesn't feel nice and warm. <laughs> Even though it's enough for the heat pump to, to extract the heat out of it, 
to us, obviously, we need probably something closer to 30 degrees before it starts to become comfortable or, or even more. So you, you're right, it probably feels cold, but it's, but it's, it's still hot enough for the, for the heat pipe system. So 13 and a half degrees, as, as the example I gave, is, is apparently enough. But yeah, I wouldn't like to stand in it for all, all day, no. <laughs> You. Hi, Peter Graham, Sunderland City Council. Just wondering, there was mention about the electricity costs and the coefficient pump, the heat pump. Mm. Is there anything on the studies looked at the energy costs associated with pumping of the water and factoring that in as well? You're right, actually. Uh, I didn't take that into account. I should have, actually. Um, maybe naively, I thought that maybe the, 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 the cost for the pumps is not, not very high, but I, I might well be quite wrong about this, uh, in the sense that these pumps, they're quite big systems, so they need electricity as well. Um, I was, again, perhaps naively thinking that if you pump water up on one end and then let it sink down on the other, that one would drag up the others, almost like, but it probably doesn't really work like that. So yeah, you're right, uh, probably on top of it, that, that is an additional electricity cost on the, yeah. for, for the running cost. And, uh, I need to adjust those numbers to make sure that I take that into account. I'm just wondering whether it's worth sacrificing some of the coefficients of performance for lower pumping costs. With it or right, right, versa. so that you pump up less water uh, so that the pumping costs are less. Mm. Uh, yeah, you, you're right. In fact, uh, the, the more water you pump up, the colder the water is going to be probably as well. So the, the two, yeah, so, so probably reducing the, the amount of water pumped up might actually save, might, might lead to some saving. Yeah, thanks, that's a, that's a good point. Any more questions in the room? Ah, here we are. <laughs> um, Chris Libby of uh, the IET member. Um, I've done a lot of work on coal mine gas coal mine gas recovery um, and there has always been the problem of sealing the pits and finding where the methane gas is, can be extracted successfully and reliably. Um, a lot of work was done in the Fife seams with Strathclyde University. Um, so my question is how much collaboration has there been between other universities and has your model been effectively tested in real life scenarios. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, collaboration with, with other universities, um, we haven't, we're looking into this. We, we're, 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 we're talking to the other universities to see if we can set up collaborations. Um, uh, in fact, we're about to submit new proposals to, for example, work with Newcastle University and also to work with uh, Exeter University because in, down in Cornwall they've got a lot of mines there as well. So we're looking into a well, collaborating, uh, using the, the knowledge of, of both universities, put it together. Um, uh, in terms of the testing of the code, the, as I, I, think I mentioned that in the talk already, this is one of the things I really would like to, to do uh, using, uh, well, existing mine system, for example, Lanchester Wines, where, they, where, they, where they have been pumping and they've got data, and test our model against this. But since we only started this, this project recently, the, the model is really still being developed. Uh, this is one of the things we, we, we now want to do. Obviously, we've, been, we've tested it against simple analytical solutions, so, but does it actually work like that? Is the, is the heat exchange really the way uh, we think it is? is? Is the flow, for example, through the water through the mines, is that, is that a laminar flow or turbulent flow? These are the kind of things that are very difficult to, to know without, without testing it. So this is also where we hope to be able to use this uh, uh, Glasgow Geoenergy Observatory because that provides us a, an opportunity to, to design a, a real flow experiment where we can test our, our code with rather than having to rely on systems that are up and running. You know, we, we don't have a say in how that's running. We just can only use the data. But you, you're right. Testing, calibrating the model is an important part that we, we, we definitely want to do. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Any more office? No, no. Wow, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much for answering the questions. Right, uh, can I call upon uh, Derek Newton here to give us a
give a, a vote of thanks for the wonderful lecture you've had this evening. Thank you for that. Um, is it on? Um, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to give the vote of thanks. Um, I, we seem to have been talking about this subject for a long time here. Um, I remember having a, giving it a talk was given, and it was going to be a scheme at Spennymoor, and the lady's name was mentioned on your... Yes, Charlotte, yes, thanks for the reminder. <laughs> and, um, and I can see why it hasn't come to fruition in some ways, because of all the, the things you've said about how to do it, how difficult it is, and you've been looking at the board and pillar workings, and a lot of the modern mining was long wall, where the face has collapsed behind it, mm -hmm. which would make it much more difficult to get water out. So I don't envy you the task of doing this, <laughs> because it's, it's really difficult. I think what you have to put, I understand why you're doing it, because it's going to be more and more important in the future to get cheap energy, mm -hmm. as we can all see by the, the news we see every day. Um, but it was a really interesting talk and a, a, a lot of things that haven't been said before and been shown what's needed. You've done it tonight. And you've done it in a really easy way to understand, uh, which is a help for all the people like myself. And uh, I would just like you to all join me and show your appreciation and the usual hospitality manner that we have here. Thank you very much.